Good afternoon. I'm Dan Bigman, the editor of Chief Executive Magazine and Corporate Board Member Magazine. Thank you for joining us for our first installment of our Summer Smarter Manufacturing webinar series, which is being made possible with the help of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. It is also a co-production of the Chief Executive Network, a leading peer network for manufacturing CEOs. Thank you to both of them for their support. Nailing a high performance operation that eliminates waste, maximizes efficiencies, and pivots quickly has always been incredibly challenging. But these disruptive times have added levels of complexity and difficulty to lean and agile processes never seen before, while also exposing the painful weaknesses of both approaches. That's why we're so happy to have with us today, Nigel Thurlow, CEO of the Flow Consortium and former Chief of Agile for Toyota Connected. Nigel is an internationally recognized industry expert on lean and agile approaches and leveraging the power of the Toyota production system than the Toyota way to enhance and develop agility in lean program development. Nigel led the successful transformation at 3M Healthcare Information Systems and was a principal trainer and coach at Scrum Inc. Nigel has taught and coached in notable organizations including GE, Bose, 3M, Microsoft, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Most recently, he became CEO of the Flow Consortium, gathering with some of the most respected experts in the lean and agile world. We're thrilled to have Nigel with us today. Before we begin, some housekeeping notes. I'll be back at the end to help facilitate Q&A. Please send your questions in throughout the presentation using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have technical issues, we're happy to help you out, but please submit them through the chat function, which is also located at the bottom of your screen. Finally, I wanna once again thank the Indiana Economic Development Corporation for making this programming possible. They're our longtime partner and a good friend of the CEO community nationwide. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nigel. Hey, thanks, Dan, and welcome, everybody. Um, I've got a lot of material I want to get through today. I want to teach you some new tools and give you some new ideas and help you sort of be able to uh, uh, solve some of the challenges you're having. So I'm going to start in one area, which is if you're going through a transformation at the moment, be that a lean or an agile transformation, why might that be not working as well as you want it to? Or why do a lot of organizations seem to fail in their transformations? So let's have a, a little look at what probably makes a successful transformation. So most companies want to reduce costs. They want to increase growth. I, I, I've, I've never met a company yet that wants to decrease growth and, and increase costs. The secret source to doing that is change of behaviors. You need to change your behaviors. This is a human factors problem, and that will result in reduction of costs and increase in growth. One of the things I find by, with a lot of companies that is they copy the tools but forget the behaviors. So everybody goes and copies Toyota's tools, TPS, Toyota's production system. They go and declare their lean, and then they start to find that things aren't quite working as they expected. And whether you're doing a lean approach or an agile approach, you miss the behaviors. You don't change the way you behave. You continue to function as you've always functioned and wonder why the transformation doesn't work. Now, this is one of the slides I put together just the other day after a conversation because I was talking to some people and it suddenly dawned on me this... There's things you want, but I need to tell you what you need. So the easy option is go to some external large consulting house, um, use some group think. We'll talk a little bit about that later on, which is where everybody nods in agreement, but everybody's really thinking, no, this is a bad idea, but the boss is saying we want to do it. And we, we outsource to some external party and we, we go to a big consultancy route with a one size fits all guaranteed to work framework. Unfortunately, the effective option is to own your own change, to find your own way and to start using the wisdom of the crowd. That's the people who work for you. And we need to use some approaches called sense making and active listening. And we're going to look in detail at those approaches and I'm going to teach you how they actually work. Recently, I did a, um, a, a sort of a fun quiz online and I asked a lot of people to participate in this sort of quiz around agile and scrum and lean concepts. The things that the consultants you're paying perhaps or the contractors claim to know. And out of nearly 650 people who started the tests, about 530 finished them, but only 15 people passed. Now, these were not hard questions. That's around 3% of those people who took the test in full passed. 
Um, there's a copy of that report is available on request. You'll, you, I'll give you some information on how to get that a little bit later on. Um, the other thing is we're finding in the industry, certificates are hugely profitable. There's just a cornucopia of them. There's a few of them on the screen. All those big blue uh, uh, acronyms on the screen are just the ones you can get from just the Project Management Institute alone. And every man and his dog is now offering you certificates. And if you attend a two-day course and pay a fee, you get a certificate that qualifies you to fly an aircraft and to perform brain surgery. And this is another reason that you're finding that you're employing these experts and you're struggling to get the results you desire. Then there's the case-based approach, which is what most of the consultants will come along with with their fine, glossy PowerPoint decks and tell you, well, it worked here, so it'll obviously work there. Um, well, that's not really any true. We need to find our own way. You cannot apply a sort of template from another organization. There are no prescriptions. I used this slide in a recent CEO uh, magazine presentation. There are no prescriptions. You can't take a one size fits all framework from a nice expensive consultancy and refill it about every three to five years. That's incredibly expensive. And we have these transformation initiatives restarting periodically as a result. You have to create your own way. A phrase given to me by Rizzo Shingo, the son and friend of mine, but the son of the late great Shigeo Shingo who worked with Ono to create the Toyota production system. Context is key. There's many tools, techniques, methods, and approaches. But if you're drilling for oil, I promise you that's very different than if you're running frontline patient healthcare in an emergency room, and very different again than if you're writing software or making cars. Context determines approach. You can't just outsource this to some cookie cutter, one size fits all, it worked there, so it'll work here approach. So now I've given you the sort of bad news about why this isn't gonna work effectively. Let's talk about how you make sense of your world and some of the tools that may help you guide a transformational strategy. I mentioned in my last presentation with CEO Magazine about weak signal detection and simply put is, how do you know what you need to know before you need to know it? On a call with Singapore last night, I asked them, would the things they were doing now be the same if they knew about COVID-19 six months ago? because they would have chosen different paths, different approaches, if they'd been forewarned of this coming. So how do we get there? The first thing we need to do is avoid groupthink. And I mentioned that a few moments ago. This is where you go into a meeting and the, the most important person in the room, sometimes called the hippo, the highest paid, highest paid person's opinion, um, is the opinion that is dominant in the room. And everybody else goes, we're just going to agree. You're afraid to speak out. There's no psychological safety. You're not allowed or prepared or you're scared to challenge the boss. Uh, and so you just go along and agree, even though you think that's a bad idea. And then you get this sort of fixation, which is called mindlessness, which is a type of fixation and re relaxation where the, your, your analyst becomes so blinkered, this fixation bias, with a few central signals, you miss all the signals in the periphery, what we call the weak signals. So I'm going to show you some techniques. I'm going to show you some actual data and some real experiments that we did to find answers that have helped me and my teams in the past. Dave Snowden's a close friend of mine. Some of you may know him. He's famous for creating the Kinevin Net, uh, framework, which is to help you uh, make sense of where you are. It's a decision-making framework to understand where you are in complex problem solving. And sense-making is just simply, how do we make sense of the world so we can act upon it? And Dave makes a, a software tool. It's nothing to do with me. It's a, a software tool that makes what I'm about to show you a little bit easier. But it's not necessary, but it's there if it needs to help you. So sense making is basically gathering information from many, many sources, conversations, anecdotes, uh, real time narrative. And I'm going to show you some of that in a few moments. Then a way to categorize that information in, in sort of a loose inventory uh, to understand the data you've collected. People are going crazy about big data and digital transformation. Loads of data is really expensive to, uh, to acquire, to maintain, and to store. And it's pretty much useless to you unless you know how to filter and synthesize the data, which is where we move on to. And there's a, a continuous process between categorizing and in, 
create an inventory and then synthesizing that data and understanding what's valuable and getting rid of all the data that's not valuable. And then what we're looking for is patterns. We're trying to detect patterns in the data that gives us clues to what is actually happening within our environment. Now, there is a technique uh, called triads. This is a sense-making technique. It's basically an equilateral triangle, triangle with all equal sides. And what we do is we draw this on a wall or you can use the sense-making software and we ask what's called a signifying question. By signifying, we mean you can signify your answer by sticking a dot on a piece of paper. Now, the most important thing is this must be anonymous. This is why using software sometimes helps, but if we, and I'll show you some manual versions of this shortly. But we ask a signifying question, and the question is very important, and it needs to be simple and allow people to signify with a simple dot vote um, their, their answer. And the other important thing is the answers are either all positive or all negative. This isn't like at style surveys. What we're looking for here is people to be able to express in a psychologically safe way their response by signifying with a dot. Uh, the important thing is it must be anonymous. And if you use dot voting today and it's not anonymous, it doesn't work because what happens is the majority wait to see where the dots are being placed and then they follow the lead, be it a manager or be it their friend or they're influenced by whichever note on the wall is most popular with the most dots. So dot voting must be anonymous. So what we did, this is a real question. We asked people what matters most is Simple question, signifying question. And we gave them three responses, customer value, usable increment, frequent delivery. And you'll see from this data, we started to draw some patterns. You will see that the majority of people put a dot in frequent delivery. Only a few people put a dot in what's called usable increments. That means at the end of a defined period of time, a sprint, an iteration, a, a work period, there are very few people thinking the work that comes out should be usable. The weak signal here is poor quality and lack of customer value focus. The majority of people are being driven by management to deliver regardless of the consequences, regardless of whether we're meeting customer expectation and indeed whether we're meeting quality. This is the type of information this process is revealing to us. Now, this is another uh, um, version of this, another question. This is using the software. This is why it's a, a lot easier to see on the screen. We asked the question, we, we put them through an experience and they went through a sort of a workshop. And then we asked the people who participated in the workshop, the most important thing in the experience I desired was, and then we asked them how we plan the work, how we work together or how we manage the work. And what we found, if you look at the patterns again, we've highlighted the patterns on the screen, about 70% of the participants said they were more interested in how we work together than how we manage or plan the work. Um, didn't mean that they were doing this already, this is what they desired. So what this told the organization that we were helping is that they needed to invest in teaming and teamwork training, and that's exactly what they did because people felt this was missing within the organization. This was a weak signal. And you won't get this from a status report. So sense making or sense maker is a tool that allows you to, to operate in this space. And this helps you to do things called mass sense. If you want to take uh, uh, this type of survey data from across multiple geographical locations or across thousands of participants, then SenseMake will allow you to do this and where they place the dots in the triangle helps us define what the responses actually mean. You will get a copy of these slides from this presentation. So the, the data or the detail in the table there, you'll be able to analyze offline. The second technique is using something called a dyad. Now I'll tell you that the typical Likert style surveys do not work. I give, an, I give an anecdote about my daughter when she applied to work for the House of the Mouse, the Disney World. And she went through their psychometric testing, which is mainly questions which say strongly agree, sort of agree, maybe agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, etc. And she tried to do it all on herself and she answered all the questions and she failed. And Disney has a rule, if you don't pass, you have to wait six months before reapplying. I did some research, realized that these types of surveys were nonsense. They're heavily biased. There's a lot of cognitive bias on anchoring of how people think you should, they want, you, you want them to answer the question. 
And so what I did, I did the research and we found that using a straightforward diet, which is a positive or negative response, a yes or a no, and when she retook the test, she answered everything simply yes or no, as if it was a binary answer, and she passed immediately without a problem. Now she's been working for Disney for some years. So we asked, using this same type of approach, we, we asked this simple question as a dyad, a binary answer, a yes or no. When problems appear, we avoid them or we over-engineer a solution. The data is really, really clear. It's indicating that the teams who were asked this question believe we're over-engineering solutions for reasons that we could dig into. And what that revealed, if you're a lean practitioner, you'll see that we've got over-processing, that's a waste. We've got underutilization of talent, another waste, and overproduction. These are the things you need to be discovering because this is where your budgets are going, this is where your money is evaporating. I'm going to take you through another case study now, and this is, I can't tell you where this was done, let's just say it was a large manufacturing company, which it was. And I'm going to sort of go a little bit further into how you can combine the sense-making triad and dyad technique with what's called storytelling and narratives. There's a thing called taking a pulse. You may have seen these if you've gone, especially in the UK, if you ever go through UK airports, you get these buttons, how are we doing today? How was your customs experience, your TSA experience? And you punch a button. That's an anonymous way, anonymous way to dot vote, to get a pulse to see what the general mood of the population are. Well, in the same way, we can actually uh, ask our employees, our staff, our associates, our networks of uh, collaborators to participate in a simple exercise. And we did this with a group of 54 people. It took about 20 minutes only to facilitate. And it was all anonymous. We basically said to them, please recall a recent project you were involved in or heard of that was frustrating or encouraging. We then asked them to do two things. The first thing was on about half a page of paper, just a normal standard size piece of A4 letter size paper, just half a page, write a news story as if you're writing a story about that experience for a newspaper. And then when you've written it, give it a headline. The important thing was to give the headline second, because if we'd asked them to do that first, they'd have come up with some sensationalist headline and then tried to make the story fit the headline. And that was the, the wrong way. We'd have got the wrong type of responses. So they all wrote their stories. We gave them all a number just to anonymize, just so we could track the, the responses, but anonymous. We didn't know who's, which number belonged to which person or name. And out of this, we got 54 stories with 51 headlines. And on the right, you'll see some examples of those headlines, death by PMO, waterfall project gone sideways, lost in email translations, there is no I in team, lack of communication dooms project. This is pretty bad. I mean, this is 54 people and nobody's saying anything good. Project from hell, Groundhog Day. Um, trust me, you won't get this from a status report or a 360 questionnaire with your staff because they'll be terrified to provide this information, but trust me, this is what you need to know. So this is some of the narratives, some of the stories that are, these are actual real stories that people wrote. And they, these people were using agile techniques like Scrum. So some of the terms in there refer to that. But one of the headlines, Rome is burning. Team members were emotionally affected and feared they were about to lose their jobs and not support their families. Execution priorities. We are taught that consumer initiatives are high priority and money saving should be next, but the enterprise is going the other way. Uh, my voice doesn't matter. When our leader caught wind of our discussions, our leader sat us in a room and said that all that matters is that these partners don't complain about us because these vendors have been long-term partners. The spelling error is the original uh, spelling. And he further went on to say, the participants said, I felt it unsafe to speak up about things I see wrong and risk to our company culture. Uh, somebody wrote political battlefield, politics and management at the top exacerbated the impact to the entire team, resulting in low morale. And finally, another example from a coach that was employed by the organization, and I highlighted some key elements here, prevent the business customer from stealing the developers. I mean, that tells you the relationship between the business and the people doing the work is terrible. Admonish any mention of impediments or blockers, as the, the, the impediments means, in the stand-up meetings after the meeting. So you raise these things, and then immediately they're admonished as being ridiculous. Create more meetings to hijack planning. 
encourage the use of social gatekeepers to do all the talking. So that's shoving somebody into the team discussion that does all the talking and creates groupthink and then removes the wisdom of the crowds. If I told you the company this was in, you'd be t absolutely horrified. And I prevented that, presented this to the entire C-suite after we'd collected the data and they were pretty speechless. They weren't really sure what to do next. We asked one of these people called a product owner, and if your language that doesn't work, like a product manager. And we said, you know, how, how are you doing? What are you doing? And they said, oh, we're doing all the easy defects first to show leadership we're making progress. And the coach said, well, what about the customer first value? And the, the product owner, product manager said, well, I'm the customer. This is completely wrong. This is uh, uh, finding behaviors that are deeply detrimental to the way you do business. And this is, you know, low hanging fruit. Let's show the boss we're all cool and good, but there's no value here for the customer. And the whole perception of the customer is completely wrong. Again, status reports are never going to reveal this. So there's a technique known as capturing real time narratives. And I give Dave Snowden the credit for this example. Um, imagine that you, if you've got children, whether you're married or have a partner and you have children and you're driving your car along on a regular basis. And after a couple of weeks, the, the kids say to you, Hey dad, well, mom or whatever it is, what do you think of the car? And your dad or your mom replies, well, you know, it's, it's okay. Actually, it's not so bad. And, and then the child pulls out the iPad or the notepad and says, well, that's funny because I've been keeping a real time narrative of every time I've been in the car with you. And actually, that's not what the narrative's telling me. Here are all the times you've complained about the car and, and complained about the, the usability and the functions and features of the car. This is extremely valuable. Now imagine transitioning that to your team whiteboards, whether you have a board on the plant floor, you, you're doing scrum and agile technique, and you have boards physical or digital. You now start to ask your coach or team lead or whoever's appropriate, scrum master or, or lean navigator, Whenever an event occurs, positive or negative, let's create a narrative. Write a short post-it note out. Hey, pick up your iPhone and make a small video. If people know a guy called Paul Akers, a friend of mine, he created something called Two Second Lean, where you grab your phone and you make a quick video to record what happened. It's a, a, an ongoing narrative, almost like keeping a diary. And then what happens when you get to your retrospectives, your hand size, lesson learns, post-mortem meetings, you actually start to debrief the real facts, not trying to remember what happened. You actually have the real facts. And when I go into a little bit about how to effectively debrief in a short while, you'll see why this is incredibly important. So this is a way to capture them as you're doing the work. Now, Let's continue. Remember, I told you the people who wrote the stories, we gave them all an anonymous number. And then we started to put them through the same sense-making triad exercise. So they'd written the story, given it a headline, we'd numbered the story. Then we asked the same participants to place a dot in these triangles. And you can see we just used painter's tape and some post-it flip chart uh, paper to be able to do this manually. And this was more than fine to facilitate this with 54 people as it was the participant number. So we were looking for clusters and for weak signals. What we want is less of the clusters, which you can see highlighted in red, and more of the clusters highlighted in green. And we're seeing some weak signals. You can see they're highlighted in the yellow color. So we're trying to identify the patterns that tell us what's actually happening in our organization and beyond. So we asked them, you know, how, within the projects and products that you described in your story, the decisions in the situation you described were made by, and then we asked them to signify whether it was team members, managers, or customers. What you start to see here is that the big majority, the largest majority of the people signified were saying decisions about what we did next were being made by managers. And only about five or six people signified that the customers were helping to make the decisions. And if you're using an agile approach, the customer's continuously involved or the voice of the customer in understanding what to do next. And when we start to see some people sort of between the two manager and customer, we want to have a little conversation with them to understand what their viewpoint is. And there's a few scattered around in team members, but this shows we're not a customer first driven organization. We're a manager first driven organization. 
Then we asked them when something went wrong in the delivery, the, and the options were team was blamed, a person was blamed, or the system was blamed. Look at the patterns. We've got a huge blame culture here, a massive blame culture. We've got a few people hedging the bets in the middle. What we want is many more things over on the side where it says the system was blamed. So this is telling us we have a pretty much command and control, maybe even dictatorial blame culture driven organization. This is not what we want to be seeing. We want to be moving people to be blaming the system. And in my Toyota days and in the sort of lean thinking world, if I fail, it's my manager's fault because they didn't support me effectively. That's the viewpoint that Toyota and lean thinking people usually take. But in this example, that certainly wasn't the case. Then we used a couple of dyads and we, we basically asked a couple of simple questions about in the situation you describe dependencies, whether they're external or internal vendors, internal teams, offshore dependencies, et cetera. What happened? Did they cause deep delays and cost us money or did they have no effect on the project or product outcome? This is, there's no question about what the data is telling us here. We have a huge problem here with dependency management and dependency mitigation, which is most of the problems we see in large scaled organizations. We've got many teams working across departments and silos trying to deliver work. And this is an area we need to heavily focus in. And then we ask the question in the situation you described cross team collaboration is best described as islands of disconnected effort, deep harmony with shared consciousness. And this now starts to show us that we have a communication, collaboration, team working, team building problem within the organization we work with. And, and the numbers allowed us, they, I told you about the numbers. The reason for this is we could sort of pick what somebody had voted. Let's say, I don't know, number 27 had said it was an island of disconnected effort. We could then go and pull out story number 27, the narrative and the headline and go, wow. And we can start to see why they said they'll gave this particular answer. This is what we call sense making. We're making sense of the data by gathering it in an anonymous fashion. So the one thing I've said this before, I think in the, the last CEO uh, network presentation or CEO magazine presentation, you've got to exploit your human sense and network. The people, the employees are your best weak signal detection array you possess but we rarely listen to them. You send out these office vibe surveys and the questions are asked in a certain way which anchors the response. Is your boss terrible or great? We know what the response is they're hoping you're going to give. That is not the type of survey you want to be given. They're ineffective and don't give you the answers you need. This is what we've been finding over the past few years. We can extend that human sense network into what's called network analysis, where we go to our extended networks. We are exploiting the company ecosystem or ecosystem, but also we need to be working with our suppliers, our vendors, our partners, by extending the eyes and ears of the company using these techniques, which allow people to respond impartially without biases and anchor anchors and in a psychologically safe way. This is how you start to identify what you need to know to make sure you can solve the problems that may be impacting you, especially in these times of deep crisis. How do you know what's going on in your company unless you're getting the people who are closest to the work telling you? And unless you're walking on the gemba, on the workplace, and on the shop floor continuously having conversations with these individuals, who in the main will be frightened to tell you the truth because their manager, their boss is managing upwards to probably you in the executive suite. The last part of this uh, sort of uh, presentation I want to talk to you about before we go to Q&A is to look at the science of teams because one of the things you have to start to understand is human factors, human behaviors. I mentioned at the very beginning, a change of behaviors is required if you want to promote growth or increase growth in the company and find ways to reduce costs. So this comes into team science, an area I've been doing a lot of working in the flow system, which is the thing on the wall behind me. So following a particular method or approach doesn't make you a team. You can't throw everybody in a room and say, we're gonna be lean and we're gonna do scrum or something else, be a team. 
The first thing to determine if you need a team is whether we're, we've got task interdependency. So if I need you and you need me to do something, we're now interdependent. So that context determines we need a team. But a team is defined in, in, the, in the literature, in the peer-reviewed literature, is two or more people working independently, adaptively, and dynamically towards a shared and valued goal. So that's important, a shared and valued goal. Shared mental models, shared co cognitions, and something we all agree and we're trying to achieve. Not some platitude mission statement, but some true deliverable goal. Now, the events in the life cycle of a team include planning, execution, and reflection. And we're going to look at those three uh, a little bit more in detail. Teamwork is different to task work. Teamwork is these behaviors, attitudes, and cognitions. And again, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. And I'm afraid teamwork's not automatic. You can't stuff people in a room around a table and go, yeah, hey, we're a team. Uh, they need to be trained how to be a team and to be coached and supported effectively. So team learning is a willingness to share knowledge and learning is critical. I mean, this is critical knowledge sharing and being able to be critical of each other's positions. Psychological safety is necessary for teams to be able to learn. If they're scared or frightened of being punished or it's not safe to fail, you're not going to get great team cohesion. We need to be able to teach them to foster dialogue in discussions and be able to communicate with effective with each, with each other. And we need to be able to amplify constructive conflict using techniques called ritual descent. This is where people can be critical of each other, but in a safe environment. We need to dampen, of course, destructive conflict, which is just hate. And we need to promote continuous reflection. So the, the sort of techniques like hand sign, which is deep self-reflection. You need to understand that teamwork and task work are very different. We employ some extremely clever people with a deep, deep skills in certain areas and we set them to work. So they are fantastic at doing the tasks and activities, but we don't teach them how to be a team. And we sort of just say, as I say, go be a team. So we need to understand that teamwork and task work are different things and just being great at task work doesn't make you effective as being a team member. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll give you a couple of highlights. Within the literature that I'm involved in and the peer-reviewed literature, there are nine C's of teamwork. Uh, there are sort of six in the, the sort of core or emergent processes within a team, things like cooperation, coordination, communication. And then there are external forces we call ex influencing conditions, which we don't, the team don't really have a control over, which is the team composition, the team that's been created, the context within which they're working, and the culture, be it a country culture or a company culture. These are all things that impact teamwork. Team design is also incredibly important. Not all teams are the same type of team. A, a technical team may be different to a tiger team or sort of a, a, a temporary team that's built to go solve a specific problem. Uh, and of course, leadership or management teams are different. And all these are based upon what type of tasks we're gonna have to perform, the technical skills that are needed, the team size that's appropriate, the teamwork skills themselves, uh, the interpersonnel skills between the various members, how we manage conflicts and how we motivate people. Um, and there is a lot of science at the moment where we're looking at things called crew resource management. If anybody's from a military background, especially a naval background, this is about self-organizing organizations where you have, and, and I'm going to be doing a talk next week on adaptive capacity, where an organization has a capability, but rather than shoehorn everybody into fixed teams long term, the organization has the ability to reorganize itself as the work changes, the industry changes, the climate changes, and we need to adapt the way the organization functions. So we start to create an adaptive capability or an adaptive capacity within the organization. Then we need to do team effectiveness training. Team effectiveness training is different to task work or methodology training. It's not putting through a project management or a scrum course. It's focused on the necessary team working skills within your contextual setting. Working on an oil rig is very different to deep sea diving, is very different to working on a production line. And the learning that we, we give, how the content and activities, has to be focused on the requisite teamwork skills needed within that context. All team members must train together because we're a team. 
Um, we must incorporate things called briefing and debriefing activities. I'm going to cover those uh, in a few moments. And we must evaluate the effectiveness of the training. So we have to test the training for effectiveness. We can't just train them and go, yeah, hey, we all got a certificate, we did the training. And it needs to be delivered in a co-located manner in real time. Now we can do that virtually, of course, with technology in these challenging times. The other thing is that teams and organizations need to start understanding the difference between what we call proximal goals and distal goals. If you're working in an organization where many teams are working together to produce something, the overall thing they're trying to produce is what we have called a distal goal. The goal that's di more distant from the uh, teams themselves, closer to the organizational aims and objectives, but the proximal goal is closer to the team. So when you're working in a multi-team system, we need to make sure that each team's proximal goals, the goals that are close to the team in each work period, sprint, iteration, period of time, are both aligned to the distal goals. And what I find in a lot of organizations that are using Agile and Scrum and other sort of scaled techniques is that they have the team goal for that sprint or iteration, but they have no focus on what they're all trying to achieve by bringing all these elements together. And we lose sight of that. And that's something that needs to be focused on. And here's a technique that we've written a lot about in the papers we've been publishing with the, the University of North Texas and indeed in the, in the new book that's coming out in the, in the very short time, is leveraging something that's been around for a good while. It's called a boundary spanner. Now, if there's any Brits listening to this, we're not talking about a wrench that the Americans would use to turn a nut. We're talking about the concept of spanning across boundaries of teams. This is a new functional leadership role, which we're saying is probably the secret source to uh, achieving uh, scale in a multi-team system effectively. So boundary spanners are operating in the boundaries between multiple teams and between multiple, multiple team systems. They're forming the bridge between the teams, making sure we're focused on the right outcomes and objectives, uh, facilitating good communication between various people, uh, fostering the interactions between the various teams and the team, team sort of multi-team systems, but also being that bridge between the leadership, the executives who aren't as participatory or engaged as perhaps they would like to be or we would like them to be. So this becomes a critical role. And why this is really important for you is this is what you do with your middle management. We've got these middle management who often feel isolated because we've got all these teams using these new techniques now, lean and scrum and stuff. And we've got the executives doing whatever executives do. And we've got this sort of frozen middle layer of management and lots of other names that describe the, the sort of what do we do here? So rather than having these managers hold lots of one-on-ones to, to justify their existence and asking for status reports and giving instructions, um, what we actually do is we repurpose the managers as boundary spanners. They become functional roles, functional leadership within the organization. We create an army of problem solvers. We have them focusing on ensuring the teams are getting all the support they need, that they are getting all the uh, facilities and tools they need, that they're fostering cross-team communication. They're teaching them and coaching them on all these team working skills. They're also using things called behavioral markers to identify whether or not we're getting the behaviors from the teams we expect. And they are essentially helping the organization to become ever more successful because they're now functional. They're not seen as a waste. And unfortunately, in these trying times, and I've seen this with some major organizations, they've been releasing a lot of these managers because they're only paying the people who do the actual work and a few of the execs. This is a way to avoid that, to repurpose to people, to have them actually focused on being deeply functional within the organization and not trying to have uh, challenges with what to do with them. We want to remove the inhibiting constraints that managers often place on teams, rules and regulations, you will do it this way. And we want to replace that with what we call enabling constraints, guidance, guardrails, mentoring, uh, leadership. And this is a, an ideal way to repurpose your middle management. 
this is the Toyota four-step on-the-job development process, which I created based upon original material. This is my version of that. Uh, and this is where really these practices need to be taught on the job, not training within industry, which is just training. This is a coach intensive approach where we're having to continuously reinforce and continuously coach the organization. Again, this is where your boundary spanners can fit as this repurposing of management, focusing on team working skills, sense making, building shared mental models and many other capabilities we think are necessary for teams. A couple of the things we found that teams are pretty bad at, planning. Go and ask your teams to describe their planning process and you will find that they struggle to describe it other than, well, we get in a room and we do this and we look at JIRA or we have a chat or we, we sort of try and figure out what we've got to do. Uh, or we have a BA do it and then somebody with a project plan does it, a project manager does it and we just follow what the project manager says. This is not planning. So we created the Toyota planning process. Um, this isn't sort of a Toyota uh, specific thing. We just, uh, my friend Brian Rivera, he's an expert with acronyms. We've all done, we've done this in Puerto Rico. We created the San Juan planning process. Um, he's very good at putting acronyms to processes. So this was really just a way to help teams establish a proper systematic uh, process for planning where we could discuss why we're there, the triggers. Do we have the technology? Do we have the team we need? Do we have the time allocated for planning? Do we know what the objective and outcomes are and how we orientate ourselves towards those outcomes? Are there any things we should be aware of? Yellow lights, cautions, anything that will attack the plan or, uh, or stop the plan from being successful, a technique we call red teaming. Um, how are we going to organize ourselves? Do we have roles? I mean, we've got job roles, but when a team creates a plan, they should at least then decide, well, who's going to do what during the execution of this plan? And if you're doing something like a daily stand-up or a daily scrum, the purpose of that is to examine the plan and to review the plan and to change the plan for the next 24 hours of work. Then finally, test the plan. Make sure the plan itself is sound. And there are some techniques to help you do that. And then after the, the work has been executed, we need to assess the outcomes. So we create a proper planning process that people go through every time to ensure we get good plans. And this is something I guarantee most of you don't have. The other thing is effective communication. If you're sitting as a, pi a passenger on a plane, you really want to hope that folks in the front of the plane are a good team. Now, here's the thing about pilots. Very rarely do they ever fly together repeatedly. They're on a roster and they'll probably end up flying with different pilots most of the time. So by teaching people something called challenge response communication, we ensure the correct information is conveyed, received and understood. The same type of communication technique can be taught to team members so there is no miscommunication over requirements or, or questions that have been asked and answers that have been given or directions from leadership or whatever it may be. We ensure adequate and effective communication between various members of the team and between multiple teams. And then we start to teach them what we call effective debriefing. This comes from work from Scott Tannenbaum uh, and some deep research is done over the years into the effectiveness of debriefing. Now, debrief is very simple. You plan to do something. That's your mission briefing. If you're using military terms, and this is a military term, you're using a mission briefing. We then go and execute the mission. You do the work. And at the end, we now need to debrief the mission. And it's been said that the debriefing session, meeting, event is the most important part of the entire mission, because this is when we learn how we can improve. So we've the, the data and the data is on the screen that they, it, uh, just a very simple debrief, a rudimentary debrief, increased team effectiveness by 25 percent on the next project. When we structured it and had a planned process for doing debriefs. This is Scott Tannenbaum's own research. The uh, increase in efficiency went up by 38%. And when a third party facilitated the debrief, we got an additional 27% of team effectiveness, a neutral party. So that gives you a cumulative increase of 65%. So if you implement effective debriefs at the end of any period of work and use some of that real-time narrative to capture 
the information that's happening during that period of work, you could get a 65% increase in team effectiveness. And I guarantee that'll save you a chunk of change and increase your uh, uh, um, revenue generating opportunities. And this is really how to debrief. They must be held regularly and scheduled, whether it's weekly, every 24 hours, etc. Uh, we debrief as close as possible in time to the experience. So if some major event happens, you should do a post-mortem a debrief immediately following that. If it's in the normal course of work and things are occurring, positive and negative, record those as the happening and then at the end of a two-week period or whenever it is, you can debrief that information and you've got real-time narrative of what happened, and now you're actually doing an effective debrief. If you go into some sort of retrospective or lessons learned meeting and start building pasta towers with marshmallows blobbed on the top in some sort of fake team building exercise, you're wasting opportunities to actually establish what went wrong and how to improve or what went well and how to amplify that going forward. Um, these sort of team building things are wasting you money. Team building only works if you're doing it within the context of the work, not in some abstract context. If you're great in an escape room, that doesn't mean say you're going to write great software together. So you must establish psychological safety. People must be safe to fail. There are many techniques around this. Look at the work from Dr. Amy Edmondson, if you want to a little bit more about that in a book called The Fearless Organization. Um, don't be afraid of silence with these things called liberating structures, which are very popular with teams to help them explore ideas without everybody staring at somebody. Uh, an opportunity to learn from the experience and not just critique it, of course. We, we want to hear from anybody's uh, experiences and we use something called active listening to do that, which basically means you listen and can uh, describe or paraphrase what you've been told without criticism or in any way sort of demeaning what the other person has said. We need to focus on teamwork, not just task work. The problem in a lot of retrospectives or hand size and things, we talk about the tasks, not how we worked together. And of course, reflect back and then use that to look forward in the improvements. If you've got a Kaizen culture, this is absolutely crucial to do this debriefing, to be able to reflect back as to what happened and then plan how to improve looking forward. Um, that's the end of the slides. We're going to invite Dan or whoever to come back and join me. And uh, if you want to know, learn more about this or you want to contact me for any help in any of this, you can go to booknigel.com. Sort of an easy way for you to, to book free some free time with me to have a, a conversation about any of the things you've heard here. And again, I will make these materials available to uh, CEO magazines so they can distribute them to all the people who have participated. Dan, I'm going to stop the screen share and invite you back for any questions. Nigel, thank you so much. That was terrific. As always, I invite the audience to begin uh, sending in their questions. I have a few. Uh, I really love the idea of these boundary spanners. These, uh, not just because of, you know, repurposing mid-level managers, but just because it really does seem to effectively tackle one of the issues that you see, which is, Lots and lots of people working their butts off doing great things who are utterly unaligned with anyone around them. And so you end up with this just kind of dislocated mess where everybody's really functional and everybody's really high performance and nothing's actually getting done right. Talk to me a little bit more about the techniques used by these boundary spanners to bring people um, together to you know, go a little deeper into the nuts and bolts of how to effectively create that position and use it. Yeah, I mean, the important thing is we need to look at something called distributed leadership, which is um, one of the techniques behind me on this picture. But essentially what that means is we need centralized coordination, distributed decision making. So things like psychological safety and something called leader's intent, or if you're familiar with David Marquette's work, commander's intent, is essential because we need people to have the psychological safety to make decisions. Then when you start to create boundary spanners, those boundary spanners need to have authority to make decisions and authority to be able to work with the teams and solve problems as they're occurring without running it up the chain all the time to get some permission. So the boundary spanner really, and, and we, some people who've operated in the sort of scrum worlds and lean worlds will say, well, okay, that's a scrum master or that's an agile coach or that's a lean coach. Well, sort of, but no, because some of those skill sets that they're using, if you're working in a small software development organization, you have multiple teams, 
you may have some sort of scrum of scrums master or some agile coach that's doing some of those things, but they're more focused on solving some immediate problems that have come up. They're not focused on teaching the team's team working skills and coaching the teams using what's known as behavioral markers. So if you want to, to teams to have closed loop communication, this challenge response communication, we need to create a behavioral marker that says, well, we want closed loop communication. We describe how that looks. How would we know if we saw it? And then the, we can then monitor and observe that. So a boundary spanner can teach that, coach it, and then observe and, and mark the progress on that. Couple that with the team having some form of self-guided correction, some self-assessment and self-guided correction. We gave dashboards to teams to do this. You bring these two together, the teams start to build cohesion and effectiveness. The boundary spanner then is connecting all the various teams that they're responsible for to make sure that their individual team focus and goals, each iteration of work, are focused on the overall outcome. We're hoping all the team's work is going to be combined to bring, and if you've got multiple, multiple team systems, which is in very large organizations, and I've worked in organizations with tens of thousands of people working on initiatives, then the boundary spanners themselves need to start creating a team. Now in 3M, we called them the Ninja Squad, and that's a friend of mine, Scott Downey, if he ever hears it, and give him a shout out. He came up with the name for that, but effectively this was an early implementation we tried at 3M some years ago, where we had the managers repurposed as problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And so their role was to support the teams. And you know, if you've got managers, and I'll say this quite bluntly, if you've got managers in your organization, or if you're one of those managers that say, don't bring me problems, only bring me solutions, they're bad managers. They need to be retrained or removed, whichever is appropriate. Because what a manager should be saying to the team is, give me all your problems you can't solve. I'm here to help you. Mm -hmm. So by repurposing these into this functional leadership role as a boundary spanner and the early implementation at three, and we took all the line managers and created a squad of managers called the, the Ninja Squad. Their job every day was to take problems from the teams, go fix them, go solve them, because they had the authority, the connections, the ability to solve problems because the teams could solve the technical stuff, but the sort of political, financial sort of, you know, organizational stuff they needed somebody else to take that away and go solve it this team won't collaborate with us won't help us or we can't get this vendor to supply something to us these are where the boundary spanners coming they start to be really functional valuable roles and not just somebody on the payroll giving instructions and asking for status reports they're breaking down roadblocks they're making sure that that people are getting listened to we all talk about listening to our people but in a pinch sometimes that goes by the wayside um, question from Mark Braun, who, uh, hi, Mark. Good, great to have you here. Um, how do you suggest using or setting up third party debriefs as part of the normal workflow? Who is the third party? And I would add to that question. We all can't bring in a third party for every week for every, every one of these. When is it, when is it more important to bring them in for the after action? When is it less important? And as Mark asks, you know, who are they? Who are these people? So, well, I'm going to just, I mean, I know Mark really, really well and, and uh, all the folks at Cambridge Air there, I, uh, I love tremendously. They're a wonderful company. So hey to Mark and to, uh, and to the, the rest of the team down there. Um, but look, I was taught over the years and Mark knows uh, Rizzo Shingo very well. There's a phrase that don't get, you don't hear very often in Toyota and I actually talk some of my, talk, some of my Toyota leaders is Genru Kanri. It means source control. Go to the source and control the problem at the source. Vendor supplier right up your supply chain to the point of where the original thing starts to happen. Don't try and solve it downstream because you're now fighting in chaos and giant waves and things. And by the same token, if you are relying on a vendor, and let's call them a partner, Let's call them somebody who partners with us to help us deliver something, to do something. Are they a critical supplier in the supply chain to enable us to function? Now, if they're selling us some components or metals or something, there's a different level of engagement. And if they are actually an external team participating with our internal teams to create some value, whether we're building a, an electronics component or a device, a vehicle, writing some software, and there's an offshore team doing some work, and an onshore team in your 
property doing some work. So once you've got the level of collaboration where continuous collaboration is necessary to create the value, they should be at every planning session and every debriefing session and every daily stand up or daily scrum or whatever you want to call that because they are part of the team or the multi-team system delivering the value. If they're just a part supplier sending you some raw materials, then you need to practice Genru Canary, which basically means if there's something wrong that they're causing a problem, you go to them and you apply the same sense-making techniques and something called situational awareness inside their organization and start Kaizaning at the source. That's a different technique, but if you're working collaboratively, you should be working together as if you were physically together and there's no excuse for not doing that there is no excuse we got video and audio and all the technology nowadays it doesn't take anything for a representative of a partner or a vendor or a supplier or somebody who's collaborating with us to join a conversation for 15 minutes a day for a daily scrum or a daily stand-up for once every two or three weeks whatever your planning cycle is to help create the plan and then to do the debrief every two weeks or whatever that cycle is when you're going to do the debrief. There's no, in my view, there's no excuse for that. There's no reason they shouldn't be able to participate. Talk about using some of these techniques in the current environment. There's, there's dealing with all of this and transformation when it's at your own hands and you realize there's mm -hmm. an issue and you need to get better. And then there's the economy that we're in right now, the uncertainty that we're in right now. What changes, what do you have to change in order to be successful using some of the, and how do you use some of these techniques to help in this current environment? Well, I mean, we'll leave the logistics and supply chain issues out of the way, other than just to say that we've probably been a little bit too lean and lean was misused. And I think I talked about this the last time we were together. It's been misused a little bit. The idea of shove it all offshore somewhere cheaper to save our costs and oh dear me, once that supply chain was interrupted, we can't actually function anymore because even Ono talked about having enough buffer stock, but one of the principles of Kanban, having some buffer to allow us to be able to function with, an, with a demand that we're getting from our customers. And suddenly if that functionality was only capable when we had a continuous uninterrupted supply chain from uh, a different country, and then suddenly that's interrupted, we should have predicted being able to uh, ensure that we had what's called robustness. Resilience is the ability to recover from the chaos and impact. Robustness is the ability to resist it. We probably were not robust enough. Uh, we thought we were resilient, and we've actually found we probably weren't very resilient and more robust. And with the sort of rhetoric coming from the US government about everybody move out of China, everybody's now rushing to find other sources. And I was on a call last night with a large electronics company talking about this and how they are now freaking out and responding about how they're going to do that. But they're probably missing some of the data. The US presidential election is yet, yet that it's not yet certain. Um, the man in the, the office at the moment is, is losing popularity. The other guy's gaining ground. You know, November may be a time to start thinking about what are we seeing, but start detecting the weak signals now and preparing to make the right decisions when we know what's going to happen. Because if Trump wins another four years, you're probably going to find some of the things we think might happen that actually do happen. But the deeper than that, if we're going to look at your organizations and how they're being impacted, if you're not talking to your extended network, doing this network analysis and some of the methods I've described, how do you know what your customers actually want? Because you're listening to the sales guy who's talking to a few folks or you're doing some sort of, uh, uh, you know, polls or some like it surveys or things. What you actually need to be doing is talking to the workforce to understand what's happening within your organization and to truly understand. And, and people like Mark Braun, who asked the question earlier on in, in Cambridge, they, they use a lot of the two second lean techniques. They continuously recording videos, continuously encouraging people to speak out in a psychological safe environment and to be able to detect things before they become a problem. If you look at some of the challenges Boeing's had, that was because that environment didn't have that culture that allowed people to pull the and on cord and go, this, this is wrong, you know, we got to stop this. Um, and so we need to deploy the sense making types of techniques and tools so that you can understand what's truly happening in your organization but you can do mass sense along your uh, extended networks using some of the digital tools to make it feasible and practical. And they're all web-based tools, by the way. 
so that you can gather those, those data points from your suppliers, your vendors, your partners, and guess what? Your customers. It's sort of crowdsourcing in a professional way. It's not sort of crowdsourcing on Facebook. It's crowdsourcing in a way that people can use a structured approach to give you input and feedback. And those patterns you're detecting start to tell you. I mean, I'm in a business of training and consulting. I'm starting to talk and do some sense making with the people who I've worked with over the years because the consulting market is badly hit. Major consultancies are laying off drove thousands of staff. The training business has been decimated. So we now need to understand what do our customers actually need help with and want help with so that we can actually respond to that. And these sense making techniques enable us to gather those data points and if you are a big data fiend, we really want to be saying, well, what data do we need? This sort of big data, thick data, and then there's this thing called useful data, which is what we really need to be focused on. But more than anything, and the, the same conversation I have with the, the company I was speaking to last night, they're in the middle of a three-year transformation, and they're about a year in. And I said, do you still have two years? You know, given where we are now, if you knew what you knew now, six months ago, would your transformation have moved in a different way? Because I said, have you got two years to complete this? Because in two years, you may not exist. And we don't know what's going to happen financially and with the, the whole health crisis and the global sort of impact of this. So we now need to start really making sense of what's truly happening and what's truly impacting us and finding those patterns in the data, looking for the weak signals we need to respond to but also looking at the patterns which tell us how we're currently behaving. And I'm afraid that within a lot of organizations, executives don't spend enough time to understand that. They rely on their reports to be able to send up the chain some form of you know, manufactured status report, the whole lies, damn lies, and statistics sort of focus. And they're not actually hearing the truth because unless you give your teams, your networks, your employees, everybody who's involved, a way to speak, you are suppressing the information that's the most valuable. And I can tell you now, the most important information comes from the people who are closest to the work. Nigel, we're going to have to leave it there. That was terrific. And I thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Nigel Thurlow is the CEO of the Flow Consortium and the former chief of Agile for Toyota Connected. And uh, we really appreciate him joining us. We also want to thank uh, the e Indiana Economic Development Corporation for supporting our summer smarter manufacturing webinar series. We will have more of these to come. And uh, I really appreciate it if you would join us for another one as we go on through the summer. Until then, good luck with all of your efforts and be good to one another. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.